Next example, we're going to look at what is the span of these two vectors. So find the span. Well, we have notation for all this. So if you find the span of the vectors 1, 0, 3. Actually, let's do a trivial example first, and then we'll do a non-trivial example. <clears throat> so what dimension are these vectors in? Three. Three dimensions. How many vectors do you think minimum it would take to span three dimensions? So if you have one vector, what do you get in the span? A line. Two vectors, you could get a plane unless they're parallel. Three vectors, you would get possibly to span all three dimensions. So minimum of three vectors to span three dimensions, or n vectors to span n dimensions. So what we're looking at is two vectors in three-dimensional space. So there's no way it's going to be all of the space, no matter what. So what we want to do is find what we're going to span. <clears throat> I picked easy vectors so that we wouldn't have to do very much actual math, or algebra I should say. We can just describe the span. What type of points, if I think of points as x, y, z, what type of points could I get with this span? Or maybe easier, what type of points could I not get with the span? <coughs> So what do we mean by no z? Every point's got a z coordinate. Can't have no z oh, coordinate. Z at the origin. So z coordinate had to be zero. That's what be the span right here. <coughs> so I could write it out. The span is in set notation. X y. I'll just write it as x y zero such that x and y are real numbers. So that's one way to write it. So I can get any x coordinate, any y coordinate I want, but my z coordinate would have to be zero. So any questions on writing that uh, set right there? How many free variables do we have? Two. X and y are free. So I have two free variables. I could have used s and t if I wanted to. So I could have written the solution out st0 such that st or in r. That would be the exact same set. If we don't write it in set notation, I could just write it like this, st0 for any s, any t, and r. So there's a couple different ways to write it. <coughs> I'll just leave these set notation versions up. So what we're going to do now is a similar problem. We're going to put uh, look for the span of two vectors in three-dimensional space, but it's not going to be trivial this time. And we're going to find the span. So our first vector, 1, 0, 3. Second vector, negative 1, positive 1, negative 3. So let's start with the definition of the span. So it's a good time to look at your cheat sheet. Do you have definition of span on your cheat sheet, or do you already know it? If the answer is no, there's an easy solution. Write definitions on your cheat sheet. So span is linear combination of these vectors, so we'll go scalars are alpha 1, alpha 2, vectors are v1 and v2. Now I want to know what type of vector or point can I make, so I'll just call that b. I want to know what type of vector can I make from this combination. So we got alpha 1, 1, 0, 3, plus alpha 2, negative 1, 1, negative 3, equals now, I don't know what should be over here for b, so I'll just go x, y, z. I could write a, b, c in there, or really any three letters I want. So I could write out the linear system in three equations, or I could just jump right into a matrix. So I'm just going to jump right into a matrix here and skip that step. 
So our first column will be alpha 1, second column alpha 2, and third column will be uh, a constant, which in this case will be x, y, z. Actually, you probably don't want x, y, z there because you're going to think variable. Let's go a, b, c. <coughs> All right, row operations. What row or operation should I do? Row one plus row two. No, I don't want to mess. Row two looks good. Three, there we go. Like that? Yeah. Okay. So what row operation can I do? <coughs> add row B to add. So let's knock out the three. So minus 3, row 1, added to row 3. Now our constant column is the only one that really has anything significant in it. It's C minus 3A. All right, do the row operation to clear out the negative one in column two. So do that yourself. Yes, as I was saying, plus row 2, A plus B, exactly. All right, is this as much row reduction as we can get? Is it going to get any better? That's it right there. We got our diagonal is already done. We have too many rows, so we can't uh, go 3 into the diagonal, so we're only going to get 2. So do we have a free variable? Remember, a, b, and c are not variables. We got alpha 1, alpha 2, and then our constant. So do we have a free variable? So alpha 1, alpha 2 are locked down. So we got no free variables. So let's write our solution here. I'm just going to rewrite the equation. Alpha 1 equals a plus b. Alpha 2 equals b. And then last, 0 equals negative 3a plus c. So there's a few different ways to write this. Uh, our last let's write our answer. If you look at our original up here, our, the way I wrote this out, we want to know what vector ABC can I make. So I basically want to describe the vector ABC. So that's what I want to be doing here. So I'm going to describe it as ABC is going to equal something. And we're going to create this something in a minute. So just remember that form we want. So I want the form ABC equals something. Now think of these three equations right here. One thing I can do is solve for A in the first one, solve for B in the second, solve for C in the third and then I'll have a equals b equals c equals. So that would be one way to do it. So the first equation a equals b my no, equals negative b plus alpha 1. I think I'm going to run out of room so let me get that vector out of the way. So a equals negative b plus alpha 1. This is not normally the way that we'd solve these. So I'm doing some a slightly different 
uh, form on these last three equations. And next up, b equals alpha 2. Now what I can do, I can rewrite a in terms of not b, but now alpha 2. So I'm going to take that minus b out and replace it with our alpha 2. So negative alpha 2 plus alpha 1. And last up, c is going to be 3a, which is 3, oops, yeah, 3 times negative alpha 2 plus alpha 1. So those right there, that's the description I want to use. And now I'm just going to write it up a little bit more nicely. And let's put things in order. So I'll go A is alpha 1 minus alpha 2. B equals alpha 2. C equals negative 3 alpha 2 plus 3 alpha 1. So that would be one way to write out our, I'll leave it in three equations first, then we'll write it in single vector equation. A, B, C equals, let's do the alpha one vector first. Alpha one times one, zero, negative three. negative one, then one. Your alpha one should be a positive three. Yeah. All right. So, all right. What are we looking at? Have you seen this equation before? Let's start. Yeah, that's what we started with. So it went in a full circle. We just transformed our answer a couple of times, or transformed our situation a couple of times. So what is a good form to write this in? Let's see. All right, well, first of all, we are looking at a plane right here. So this uh, spanning set's a plane, a two-dimensional object. That would be one way to write the vector equation of a plane. If you want to write the uh, other, Let's see, that's probably the best way to, the best equation to use. That is the equation of a plane in x, y, z coordinates right there. And if you didn't take calculus three yet, then I think I'll describe geometry a little bit, but this will be a uh, one linear, linear equation, reduces your solution by one dimension. So this would be a plane in three dimensions right here. So it's a two-dimensional plane in R3. Uh, so that would be one way to describe it right there as that plane. Uh, the other ways are all written on the page here depending on what version you want to use. All I did was turn A into X and C into Z right there. That'll be the plane spanned. Uh, I will talk about how we get a. Oh, actually, we'll look at that right now. How we define a plane in R3. I think we're very zoomed out, so let's zoom back in. Yeah. So, where did that zero? came from the last equation I just put the proper name for those coordinates in. Basically it was the equation that didn't have alphas in them. So now we're going to look at a plane. So plane at R3 is defined 
you could define it with one point on it and two vectors. You can also define it with less information. So we'll define it with a point on the plane and a normal vector. And I'll draw a picture of a plane in three dimensions. So we're going to have a single point on the plane and a normal vector. I'll use purple for that. So this normal vector n is perpendicular to the plane or normal to it. So it's sticking straight out of it. Uh, there's technically two direct, you could go with up or down and you could pick any length vector you want except for length zero. That would not be a very good direction. If your vector is length zero, you're not pointing any particular direction. So normal could point on either side of the plane. Uh, usually we use a unit vector, which is length one. We'll get to some of those properties soon. Uh, so a plane is defined by a point and a normal vector. And we'll give this point a name. We'll call the point P. And that will be x naught, y naught, z naught. And of course our normal vector is going to be n. So here's the equation of the plane n dot x minus p equals zero. where this capital X is any point on the plane. So we have a fixed point P and then any other point we'll call capital X. So what we're doing is we're forming a vector between these two. And then when that is a right angle or 90 degrees, then that uh, point will be on the plane. So I want to turn a plane span by two vectors and containing a point. Actually, in our case, our point will be the origin. So that means P is going to equal zero, the zero vector. So turn this plan, uh, plane span by two vectors and containing the origin into the dot product formula. So I'll draw the plane out again. So we do have the point P, it's really the origin for our case, but I'll just leave it as P for now. There'll be two vectors in here. We go V1 and V2. These two vectors are gonna be spanning the plane, meaning they're both living in the plane and they're not parallel. How do I get a third vector that sticks directly out of the plane? Cross product. So that's a little more geometric property, but if we cross those two vectors, we'll get our normal vector. So n is going to be v1 cross v2. And then you can use your equation of the plane we just wrote above. Point X is any point on the plane. So this is way more geometrical. Everything I described here, cross product, uh, gives you a perpendicular to the, your two uh, vectors that are in there. So what we did, instead of doing a cross product and getting the normal that way, what we did is a bunch of linear algebra to get our normal vector. 
what is a normal vector in our last example? So for our case, it was negative 3, 0, 1. It's the coefficients of x, y, and z. Uh, but everything I'm writing in purple, you don't need to know for this class. This is just geometry relating it back to calc 3. So we're not doing geometry, so I'm not going to do uh, the geometrical solution to these type of problems. We're going to do the algebraic solution. Uh, but I just want you to be aware of what's going on in the background. There's all these things in the background. So if you have taken Calculus 3, this should be somewhat familiar. And if you haven't taken Calculus 3, when you get there, you'll know how to solve those problems using linear algebra instead of geometry. So let's look at linear independence slash dependence. I'm going to write all the notes for this section in 2.4 because I'm going to just do independence and dependence at the same time. So I'm going to put 2.4 and 2.5 in the same. So I'll just write in 2.5 C2.4. So I'll write all our notes here. So let's start out with uh, definition. Where should definitions go? On your cheat sheet. If I ask you, oh, there's going to be a lot of questions like, uh, are these linearly independent? And if you don't know what linearly independent means, you're pretty much screwed. You can try to put them into a matrix and row reduce, and that's probably a portion of the answer, but you won't be able to answer the question if you can't read the question. So you can perform row operations, but you won't really know how to formulate the answer. So make sure that you know definitions. And I recommend that probably should be about a one quarter of your cheat sheet. So a good part of your cheat sheet needs to be definitions. And this is definitely an important one. Spans, another one we just used, and a whole bunch of other stuff that I forgot. Those are all important as well. So they need to go on your cheat sheet. Let's go with a definition for linear independence. So we're going to start with n vectors, v1, v2, dot, 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 vn. So the set is linearly independent if alpha 1 v1 plus alpha 2 v2 plus dot 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 alpha n v n so if this linear combination equals 0 has only the trivial solution So this solution is called trivial because you don't need to know what the vectors are to know there is already one solution. So what is the trivial solution without knowing anything about these vectors? What scalars, alpha 1 through alpha n, can I use to make this add up to the zero vector? All of them zero. So that's the trivial solution. It doesn't matter what these vectors are. They could have huge values in them, small values, doesn't matter. They could all be zero all be parallel, all be completely different. But if I multiply them each by zero, add them together, I'm going to get zero. So we call that the trivial solution. So the trivial solution is all of the alphas equals zero. So you can just write it all together. Alpha 1 equals alpha 2 equals dot, dot, dot. Alpha n equals 0. Now remember, homogeneous system always had at least one solution, which was the trivial solution. So you always get the trivial solution. You're independent if that's the only solution. 
So if there is one or more solutions besides the trivial, it's what we call dependent. So linear dependence is when there are other non-trivial solutions. Now if your problem is linear, if you get one non-trivial solution, any scalar multiple of that will be a non-trivial solution. So let's test for uh, independence or dependence. First vector, one, two, zero, one, one, negative one, one, four, two. So we got three vectors in three-dimensional space. Let's write out their linear combination. Alpha 1, 1, 2, 0, plus alpha 2, 1, 1, negative 1, plus alpha 3, 1, 4, 2. What vector are we trying to equal on the right side? 0, the 0 vector. So I got 0, 0, 0. Remember that bold zero is a zero vector in the correct dimension, so it makes sense. So in this case, three dimensions, so three dimensional zero vector. All right, we can put it in a matrix and row reduce. You don't have to write the zero, zero, zero column, but if you decide to not write it, then make sure you put a vertical bar so you know that there are zeros, the invisible zeros over here on the right side. So I'm just going to leave off the zeros on the right side. Actually, I'll use this gray to write down what I'm not going to keep writing. All right, do some row operations. There shouldn't be too many you have to do here. So do some row operations until you can draw a conclusion and decide. For sure, zero, zero, zero is a solution. Are there other ones? So decide if there are other ones. It will have everything to do with free variables, whether you have free variables or not.
any row operation questions, you should get alpha 3 is free. What, <coughs> what does a free variable mean when it comes to the number of solutions? How many solutions do we have to the system? Infinite. So do we have more than one solution? Yes, we have a lot more than one solution. All I needed was two or more. So we already knew the zero solution, the trivial one was going to work. If I get one more solution, I know I have dependence. So guess what? I have infinite more solutions. So when I write non-trivial solutions, you'll have an infinite number. It goes from having the trivial solution to having an infinite number of solutions. There's no time where you'll have two solutions. It'll go from the single trivial solution to infinite. Uh, you could have two or three free variables and still get infinite solutions, but all it takes is one free variable to get your infinite solutions. Now, let's look at the question. Well, it wasn't really asked as a question, but it was, is this linear in linearly independent or linearly dependent? So I don't have to exactly write out what this solution would be. I just know that I have a free variable, so I have infinite solutions, and I can say dependent right away. So I don't have to keep doing any more algebra. So a alpha 3 is free. We get infinite solutions. So that means includes infinite non-trivial solutions. So we have linear dependence. So basically, free variable means dependence. No free variables uh, will mean independent. If they're all free, then that'd be very dependent. Now, if they're all free, you're probably looking at this uh, span, probably the zero vector, which would be the extreme uh, version of that. Well, if they're all free, that means you can choose any alpha values you want, not just zero, zero, zero. So let's let's actually construct this solution to see what it looks like, and maybe that'll uh, provide a little more um, insight. So if you do your raw base, you didn't get all the I mean, you're still We would be very dependent. Because there would be an infinite, there would be a huge number of solutions. Like, the more free variables you have, I don't want to say the less independent you are, because you fail to be independent, you're the first free variable you get. But you'll be further away from being independent. So I'm going to write out the equations. There's only two that I really need. So we have a free alpha 3. So pick an al any alpha 3 value that's not 0. Pick an easy number. 1. 1's pretty easy. I like it. All right, alpha 3 is going to be 1. What we're going to get is uh, alpha 2 and alpha 1 now. So I'm choosing. So whenever you see the word let, you're making a choice. But I'm choosing alpha 3 to equal 1. And now I can get my alpha 1 is negative 1 third, it looks like. I'm doing lazy algebra now. Uh, let's see, alpha 2, uh-oh, what is alpha 2? Is that negative a half? No. Negative 2? Ah. Is that right? Negative three. Yeah, that looks right. Okay, so look, we just wrote down a non-trivial combination right here. So this is one solution. That's not zero, zero, zero. You could have picked any alpha three you wanted except zero, and you would get another solution. And so as many alpha three, you can pick whatever value you want alpha three and get a different solution. 
if I had two free variables, I could not only pick alpha three, I could pick alpha two as well. That's what would happen if I had two free variables. I'd have more choice here. Um, and if I had three free variables, I could just pick anything I wanted. Uh, but the only way three free uh, the only way to have three free variables if I had the equation zero equals zero. All right, so that is linear independence and dependence. So here is a theorem. The column vectors in A are linearly dependent. If AX equals zero, has a non trivial solution. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to look at dimensions. We have m vectors in R n, so that's v1, v2, vm inside R n, and m is greater than n. So that means we have more vectors than dimensions. What if we had five vectors and two dimensions? So I'll write the conclusion as a blank. We'll fill the blank in in a minute, but I'm sleeping some space. So let's consider Thank you. Five vectors in two dimensional space. Actually, do four vectors. I don't feel like writing five out. So I'm going to write the system. What is the minimum number of free variables I could have here? Two. I possibly could even have three or four in a worst case scenario. But minimum, I got two free variables no matter what. So I got two minimum of two free variables. So any questions on why this is guaranteed two free variables or more? Just because we got more columns than we have rows. So now we're going to do, and what does that mean? If we got two or more free variables, how many solutions do we have? Infinite. infinite. No matter how many more free variables I get, I get infinite solutions. So let's go back to this theorem. It's saying the same similar thing, but it's just written out not inside of a matrix. So if I have more vectors than I have dimensions, 
what can you say about linear independence or dependence? It has to be dependent because we have free variables. Then the vectors are linearly dependent. All right, so that is a theorem. If you got more vectors than dimensions, you automatically get dependence. You got too many vectors. So you are, should already be noticing that almost everything we've done so far comes down to row reduction. But you have to know what you're turning into what when you row reduce. Just like you learned algebra for years and then you went through pre-calculus and you used algebra, then you went through calculus and you used algebra, now you're linear algebra, you're using algebra, so it's something you just keep on using over and over again. Row operations are kind of like that. It is something that uh, you can do a lot of algebraic operations very quickly and easily, but you have to know what does that mean. So for example, you, Way back in pre-calculus class, you may have been finding x-intercepts, or maybe you were looking for symmetry, but you were going to use algebra either way. It's kind of like that. Of course, you're doing, uh, you're setting your algebra up differently, depending on what you're doing, but you're still going to do algebra. So you're going to find that here. Row operations are that algebra step, but you have to know how to turn your situation into a matrix and then how to draw a conclusion after you're done doing row operations, and that's the tricky part. <coughs> So we're going to move into the next section. So we're skipping, we're well not skipping, but we did 2, 4, and 2, 5 together. So we're going to go to 2.6. So this is called orthogonality. So that's the smart people word for orthogonal, when things are orthogonal. Anybody remember what orthogonal means? from Calculus 3 class. Perpendicular. And of course we've been looking at vectors, so we're going to look at perpendicular vectors. Easy to draw. Well, that's not perpendicular. Don't talk and draw. There we go. Perpendicular. All right. How in the world do we know two vectors are perpendicular if, especially if they're in maybe four dimensions? You can't just draw things in four dimensions. Even three dimensions. Two dimensions you can kind of have a good graph and kind of eyeball it, but kind of eyeballing it is not how we should be solving math problems. How do we determine orthogonal or perpendicular? Come on, calculus three students. How to know if two vectors are orthogonal or perpendicular? Their dot product is zero. So we're gonna have to look at the dot product. So in order to look at orthogonal, we need the dot product. So we looked at scalar multiplication before. This dot product is not really related to scalar multiplication. Uh, it does act like a product, but not like that product. So we're going to look at the dot product now. So the dot product takes two vectors and gives a scalar. And the way we're going to write it is v dot u equals a scalar. So it's a operation that inputs two vectors, outputs a scalar, and the way we compute it, if v is v1, v2, dot dot dot, vn, and u is the same with u1, u2, un, and v dot u, all you're going to do is multiply the first coordinates together and then the second coordinates together and then add them. And then do the same thing for the third. So 
So that's our dot product right there. So it's a really good time to introduce some way better notation. So this is called sigma notation. It just means the sum. And you have the start and the end values already written here. So this right here is what we call sigma. Sigma notation, it means add up terms. Beginning at the bottom value. Ending at the top value. And incrementing by one. So right there, I can, without looking at the very top line, if I just look at the sum, I know the first term is going to be u1 times v1, and that'll be added to, the next term will be u2 v2, and you keep adding until you get to un vn, the last term. So that sigma notation corresponds to exactly what's written right above. So that is dot product. And I think, what clock, is that clock right? All right, so let's do one example. Let's just take those vectors we were working with a minute ago. I think they're 103, 103, and negative one, one, negative three. So we're gonna take the dot product of u and v We have one times negative one plus zero times one plus three times negative three. So that's negative one plus zero minus nine. And we get negative 10 for that dot product. So dot product is very easy to compute. Also very easy to forget how to compute. So if you haven't computed dot products before, that's a really good thing to put on your cheat sheet, how to compute dot products. If you made it through pre-calculus class, and especially calculus three, you probably don't need dot products on your sheet sheet. But if you do, make sure it gets on there.